I'm not sharing myself. <laughs> It's not a good policy. Huh? It's not a good. Oh. It's not a good policy. So welcome to this uh, second part of this morning. Uh, so I have the honor uh, to introduce Phil Trin, in case you haven't met him before. <laughs> uh, and he's going to talk to us on the past and future of exponential asymptotics. So please, Phil. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to, to Gerald for leading the organization of this uh, the workshop and also to the other organizers for um, organizing this wonderful program in general. So I've taken a pretty uh, ambitious title, but uh, there is a reason for this title. I mean, it's supposed to be the last workshop, so we're supposed to be a little bit more grandiose. Um, but here we are. So uh, let's go into the past. I started as a DPhil student in 2007, and uh, John Chapman gave me this. So this was a talk that he gave some 15 years back, beyond all orders, the future of asymptotics. Um, and so in my talk, you know, we can try to update this now in 15 years later. Uh, what are the challenges in some of, uh, some of these applications of exponential asymptotics? I also realized um, this is an audience where we're all using different techniques of beyond all orders in some capacity. I'm mainly talking about, you know, what, what I call applied exponential asymptotics, which is applied to singular perturbation problems and differential equations. But we all know it's interlinked, you know, hyperasymptotics and resurgence and everything is linked together, but I just want to uh, make sure that's clear. Okay, so uh, I also asked Chris Howell to provide me with some of the documents. So this is from the 1995 meeting, the pre-meeting to this one, um, and it's just out of interest and, and you can see some familiar names. I've included the names of people who might have participated in that meeting and also participated in this meeting as well. Um, I might have forgotten some people, but uh, you could let me know afterwards. So we have Audrey and, and uh, Carl Bender was uh, here uh, uh, um, electronically, and then uh, Joshi, Peter Clarkson, Howell, Barry, and so forth. That was, a, that was a, a document from a final meeting of that workshop, and then we also have uh, another meeting, this one in asymptotic analysis, and you'll also recognize some names as well. One thing to take away for the young people in the room is the number of doctors on this list who are now professors. And uh, I think that's a good trend if we can continue that to the next meeting as well. Okay, so here is my uh, brief to-do list. Mainly, um, so I'm gonna give you a brief review of exponential asymptotics, just it is a, a broad audience. Um, I'm going to talk about, the main thing is item two. I want to talk about PDEs. If you do think that PDEs is the future application of exponential asymptotics, that's where the field needs to go, then item two is the one to focus on. Um, three and four is about my own research, but um, to me the focus is really just to talk about the difficulties of PDEs, but I will tell you about some of the problems that I'm struggling with in, in three and four, and then five is just more, more amusing about you know, where we want to go uh, in the next couple years. Okay, so here's a brief review of what I mean by applied exponential asymptotics. So we're primarily interested in, in the study of uh, nonlinear, ordinary, or partial differential equations. So here's an example of such a singly perturbed differential equation. This is a model uh, motivated from Kruskal and Seeger's crystal growth problem. We would try the usual thing and expand it into a series expansion in powers of epsilon. We know that the leading order uh, term, the leading order term is typically divergent, and that will force divergence in the late order terms, and so we optimally truncate it and try to develop an equation for the remainder. 
generically, you, you end up with the linear equations for the remainder, which is then forced by the divergence. And this is the, you know, this deep connection of exponential asymptotics where your late terms, uh, phi n, are then linked to the exponentially small terms or expansions of other saddles, et cetera. So if you can somehow obtain an estimate for these late terms, then that will allow you to then solve this equation for the remainder and find the switching on or off of terms by this Stokes phenomena. So in this case of this third order problem, this is the term that's, this is the exponentially small term uh, which is switched on. And as I continually point out, the key is to notice that the divergence is then linked to the exponentials which are switched on. So you can find one with the other, okay? Hopefully most of you also know about Dingle's condition. So this is a condition that tells you where one exponential can switch on another. So sometimes we write this as one greater than two. So one will switch on two. And uh, if, if, this is, if this condition holds in, in most cases. In the problem that I've written down here, uh, the base asymptotic expansion here is, has an exponential of zero. So you think of e to the zero switching on this exponentially small term. And then uh, the Dingle criteria is as written there. Okay? So hopefully we're all familiar with this kind of approach. And this is a generic approach. I mean, the truth is that most of the applications we work with, we're applying the same formula and just cranking the handle. But the beauty is in the subtlety of applying this technique to different kinds of problems and um, understanding how things like singularities will affect this analysis and trying to study the trans series and so forth. Okay. So here's a canonical problem that uh, was talked about at a previous workshop. Um, this is the problem of trying to understand water waves past a, past a wave uh, producing body, so a wave past a ship. So this is a classical problem in hydrodynamics. It's a difficult problem. You're trying to essentially solve a partial differential equation for the potential, for the velocity potential of the water. So this is given by Laplace's equation. You have uh, Bernoulli's equation, some kind of nonlinear boundary condition on the free surface, and then kinematic conditions all around. So um, Bernoulli's equation complicates life, and, and so too is the fact that the free surface is unknown. So it's a classic problem that's been known for, for hundreds of years, um, but still extremely hard, okay? And it's extremely hard because because the geometry of the problem makes it uh, quite difficult as well. Now, this over the last kind of two decades, this has become a playground for exponential asymptotics. The idea is that if uh, epsilon here governs the speed of uh, of the flow, so for low speed waves, the free surface is almost entirely flat, and if you can then expand it into a series expansion in powers of epsilon, and then the water waves that you observe, that we all physically observe in this limit, are governed by exponentially small terms. So this is where the exponential asymptotics comes into play. So uh, I'd say that this, is, this hydrodynamic problem is important for two reasons. The first is that it's, it's a deep historical problem. Low fruit, uh, low fruit or low speed theory was extremely important for the development of uh, wave structure interactions theory. Um, and it's an applicable problem. And we can see the things that we're switching on with the Stokes phenomena, right? We can see these exponentially small waves. The second reason is there, there's kind of an infinite number of ways you can modify this problem. And all of those will produce very interesting and beautiful exponential asymptotics for you. So you can modify the, the, the body of the ship. And as you're doing so, you're essentially moving around or modifying properties of singularities in the complex plane. You can add additional physical effects like surface tension. You can combine gravity with surface tension. You can add vorticity and viscosity. There's kind of an infinite number of ways you can uh, uh, add and, 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 and develop more realistic approximations to the physical world. And in doing so, you're continually developing your exponential orthotics. So that's why this has been such a popular and fruitful um, toy problem for us. There are other applications of exponential asymptotics that you might have seen over the last uh, period of the program. So things like trying to understand the, the structure of these little ripples on steep gravity waves. Uh, you can extend that and look at standing water waves. And again, if you add a little bit of surface tension to this problem, that should uh, produce ripples. And those are determined by exponential asymptotics. The uh, Kruskal and Seeger crystal growth problem was one of the problems that launched this area of exponential asymptotics. Sath and Taylor viscous fingering, and also viscous fingering, much more challenging geometries that we still don't really have theory for, okay? So as I, as I explain, this kind of idea of exponential asymptotics, why is it important? You can think of the importance as two, two 
into two categories. One is in terms of applications and, 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 and new and explanatory theories for applications. And the second is just that this is a, a you know, we, we are, a lot of us are mathematicians. This has become a playground for developing deeper and deeper theories of asymptotics, which is also important uh, on, a, on a more fundamental level. So I, I had this, um, I tried to do this uh, two days ago, just try to write down all the applications of exponential asymptotics I could think of. Um, and I originally put a list of references, people to acknowledge who had worked on many of these problems, and I realized um, I'm going to take, I'm going to risk offending quite a lot of people if I admit any names. So I leave you to put in your own names on the right-hand side here as an exercise. Okay, but there have been many interesting applications of these theories, everything from, as I said, uh, waterways, vortex reconnection, crystal growth, thin film rupture, so on and so forth. The key takeaway is that many of them are for ODEs, linear, nonlinear ODEs, things that you can often convert into integral equations. There has been extension systems of ODEs, integral differential equations, and so forth, but PDEs remains an open challenge in this area. And, and so the question is, why is PDEs so difficult? So let's talk about that. Okay, so um, I think you know, personally, I think there are three papers, three very interesting papers in the mid-2000s, which we should revisit because um, if we want to push things forward in singular perturbation theory for PDEs, uh, these papers are probably considered to be quite seminal. So the papers are written by people who you all know. So the three papers are linked together. They were um, part of a uh, uh, not co collaborative, but, but also done independently, so a program to study p um, wave evolution uh, and exponential asymptotics in PDEs. The first one by Chris Langman, uh, uh, Chris Howells, uh, Philip Langman, and um, Audrey Oldahuis. So this is more on the integral side of things. The second paper by John Chapman and David Mortimer, uh, which studies the same problem um, uh, introduced in, this, in, in the first one, but in a multitude of ways, more so on the PDE side of things. And then finally, you can consider this as a generalization of, uh, of the system that was studied in the first two. I do recommend that if you read these papers, they're quite long, there's like 40 pages each one. Um, if you do read, each one, uh, read them, you, uh, try to read them in this order. I think it's a good order to go through as it goes into kind of generality. There are other works on PDEs I want just to note um, a few that have appeared, but uh, I want to go through some of the details of these three ones, because I think it's important for us to, to, to understand the challenges from the perspective of these three. Okay, so the, 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 paper, the first paper um, by, by Howes et al., um, I think the main contribution was to publicize this connection that had never uh, been previously acknowledged of the higher order Stokes phenomena and PDE. So the higher order Stokes phenomena had, had, had been known to arise in differential equations, and essentially they point out that this is a very generic thing, not only for differential equations really, but all divergent series will have this uh, generic issue, um, and then they connect it with a PDE. So I want to provide us a very simple explanation of what this higher order Stokes phenomena is, okay? So the, the idea is that you, you think of a problem with three exponentials or three saddles, okay? And they can interact, these three, three saddles. So you then consider a situation, quite a generic situation, where two of the Stokes lines will cross. So we have a, a, a crossing Stokes line, this Stokes line where the one exponential switches on the two exponential, and then this Stokes line where the two exponential switches on the three exponential, okay? And what you try to do is you just go and form this analytic continuation game and you go in a circle. So you start off with, I have my one exponential in one sector, it switches on two, two switches on three, one switches off two, and you have a problem because by the time you get back to the start, just by the way, this line doesn't do anything because the two exponential is not present to, to do any switching. By the time you get back to the start, you have three in there and there's an inconsistency, okay? So you think, right, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, um, I've forgotten there's another Stokes line in this problem, and I'm going to try to put it in, but that doesn't fix things in the end either. Okay? And then you end up with a very weird thing, which is that the Stokes line has switched off halfway through. Okay? So this is the higher order Stokes phenomena. You might uh, define it as the higher Stokes phenomena is this occurrence where a Stokes line can go from active 
to inactive. It switches off. Very weird thing. Okay? And you can also show that this switching off happens uh, across this higher order Stokes line, this red curve. Also very weird. Okay? So l l let's just give a very concrete um, uh, visualization of this process. Okay? So this is the classic Piercy example. So uh, you have this integral of uh, um, e to the, uh, so the action is a fourth order polynomial. And you can go and find the, the saddle points of this function. So you just take the derivatives of f with respect to s, and then you end up with three saddle points of this problem. Here, and here, z is a parameter of the system. So you're interested in what happens when z starts to move around in the complex plane, in particular, what happens to the steepest ascent procedure. Okay? So um, in this video, oh, it's quite tricky to play this video. Okay. So in this video, on the top left, you see the parameter plane. So that's the z plane. Okay? And we're going to start off with this point here marked by the white circle, and then just consider the integration of this function. So um, I start off with my initial uh, contour, which is marked red, and I consider the deformation of that red contour in the integration plane, so it just picks up the saddle point zero. So in this case, at this value of z, I only have one saddle point contribution, which is zero. Okay? And then it rotates around, rotates around, and as I begin to cross this line here, which I've marked zero switching on one, you can see that zero will, is just about to switch on one. And at that point, you have two saddles. So this is your Stokes phenomena. And the, the, the issue here is that as I'm about to cross this line, where I would have predicted that zero switches on two, nothing happens because, in fact, zero is not adjacent to two. Okay? So that line that you would have predicted just from a naive application of Dingle's uh, condition should not actually be present. Okay? And then uh, it, it continues. So uh, on the other side here, you can see the white circle is about to cross this line. Zero is about to switch off one. Zero switches off one, and I just have uh, zero and then two. Okay? So viewed from the perspective of the integral, this, this switching off of the Stokes line is, is very natural. Right? Just by the way, there's a way to visualize this as well in the so um, You can think of this as the Borel plane. If I, um, if I just do a coordinate transformation of f, so I set u to be equal to f, for instance, then the paths of steepest descent in this u plane are then, hor are, are then horizontal. So uh, just to give you an idea of how to read the graphs on the right here, let me go back to the original configuration. My integration curve is quite hard to see. It's this red dashed line. And I'm going to deform that now so that I pick up the one saddle, the blue saddle here, which in the previous picture was down there. Okay? As I'm about to cross the first Stokes line, where zero switches on one, this zero switches on one, one of the uh, critical points on, the, on one of the adjacent Riemann sheets will come down. So you'll see here the point has appeared now on the principal Riemann sheet, and you should pick up the two contributions. Okay? So the point is that you can think of things in different ways. You can think of it in the, in the original integration plane. You can do a coordinate mapping and think of it in terms of this uh, Riemann sheet structure in this simplified U plane, um, and you'll come up with the same conclusions. Okay. So uh, the, the question is, how would you have predicted this from the perspective of the differential equation? That's essentially the, the main issue, right, when you don't have access to the integral uh, formulation. So in the, the paper by, by Howes et al., they essentially explain that you can, uh, you can also develop a theory of hyperterminance. So you can look at the, the way it diverges and the divergence of the remainder, and you can essentially... Um, apply this theory and, and, and develop criteria for the higher order Stokes lines. And I want to show it in, in a slightly different way here. So let's return to the Chapman and Mortimer in this 2003 paper. And I want to mainly explain how they study the partial differential equation. Uh, but, but, but let's say a few words about the integral approach first. So this is the, the PDE that you're interested in, phi is a function of s and t. You have a boundary condition, or two boundary conditions, and then you have um, your initial condition. 
Yeah, this problem was cooked up. Well, I mean, it was cooked up. So I, I'm told it was cooked up so in the following way. So the, the steady state solution is actually the crystal Seeger crystal growth problem, or it's a linearization of the crystal Seeger crystal growth problem. So that is, you, you would have noticed that in my little review of the first, uh, the first few slides. So essentially, you can think of it as a time-dependent generalization of that model. That's the, the cooked up feature. And what's nice about this problem is that you can actually Fourier transform it, and then you can just write it in terms of these two integrals. So it's a problem that has an integral formulation, and then you can essentially do the techniques in parallel. You can study the integral, and you can also study the PDE. So when you write it in this way, it, it splits off in, into a time de independent integral and a time dependent integral. And then you're interested in the steepest extent deformation of these integrals, and you can end up with endpoint contributions from zero here, pole contributions from the plus or minus p <coughs> one pole, and then also saddle point contributions from this uh, functional. Okay. So here's an example of the kind of analysis that you would do. Um, so the idea is that you're going to uh, put in values of s and t, in real s and real t for now, and then just consider what happens to the deformation of this integral as s and t varies, the same uh, form as before. Before you do that, you want to essentially establish where the possible switching ons can happen. That's given by this equal phase condition. So that gives you the possible Stokes line picture on the left-hand side here, the Stokes line will be some subset of these curves, okay? So for instance, this is plotted real part of S and real part of T, and we're just gonna move along the free, we're gonna move along the, uh, the, the points from A to B to C to D to E to F, and just see what happens to the deformation of that integral. So for, for example, I start off at the point A, I just have one contribution from the, uh, from the endpoint, from zero. And then I go to the next point B, and at that point, you can see I've, I've pre-predicted the black line where the endpoint switches on the saddle, and you see that as well in the integration plane. And uh, you go to point D, and so forth and so on, okay? Okay, so the basic idea is that you do your integration and uh, integral analysis, and you establish whether Stokes lines are active or inactive. And this is the picture that you will, you will develop, okay? Stokes lines can be irrelevant because the thing that's supposed to switch it on is not actually present. It can also be inactive because it, it might have been switched off by this higher order Stokes phenomenon. Um, I also point out there's, you know, there's, there, there are subtleties to this analysis that, I've not, uh, that, that I, I won't mention as well, like what happens if uh, time goes to zero and there's some boundary layer asymptotics to be done. But, this is quite straightforward. The point is this is straightforward because we have access to the integral. Um, this is a picture from, from Howes et al, and they point out the fact that you can actually observe the, the, the square. So this is the numerical solution of the integral equation, and you've subtracted out your leading order solution. So this is, um, yeah, this is numerical solution minus leading order solution, okay? Now, on the top graph, you've, you take numerical solution minus leading order solution minus the first exponential correction, right? And the point is that this, the long time behavior is not actually correct. So these um, striations that you're seeing are actually supposed to be straight. And if you were to do the proper Stokes line analysis, you would have predicted that actually there's a pole contribution and now this, these two pictures then match. Okay, so how do you begin to do the PDE analysis for this problem? Um, you wanna go this way instead. So you wanna develop an asymptotic expansion, and in the Chapman and Moore analysis, they perform an analysis of this phi n term. And in general, this phi n term is quite complicated. It's some summation uh, over these components, which I've written as bnj, and bnj will satisfy certain you know, recurrence relations. And they really throw the book at this uh, at this problem, they essentially do it in three different ways, three uh, independent ways. So the first way you can do it is that there's a way to reformulate this bnj as an integral equation. The second way you can do it is you can try to study the asymptotics of this bnj and the limit that n tends to infinity. And the third way you can do it is you can try to guess what the form is, these factorial over powers, and see if you can solve for the components. Okay, and um, I don't think there's much 
to go into for these details other than just to point out that it can be done. It was done. It takes a lot of work. All three ways match up. Um, you, can, you can posit the correct factorial over power expansion for the late order divergence. You can find the components A and the components chi. Um, it's quite subtle how it's done. It, you have to solve PDEs in order to obtain these uh, components, but it can be done. Okay? So this is proposing that the methods that we've developed for ODEs, for nonlinear ODEs, can be extended to PDEs. They're just a, little, a lot harder. Okay? Um, some caveats of this approach. Firstly, it's quite hard to read the paper and to figure out whether you could have done it without having the exact solution and you know, reverse engineered it in the first place. So I think that's an important question. The second is that um, you have to remember this PDE that they propose is actually really simple from the, in the grand scheme of things. And so they were able to get um, the components, A, chi, gamma, et cetera, of this divergence but in, but in reality, you may not be in a position to get it analytically. And then thirdly, this higher order Stokes phenomena structure is extremely complicated. You, you, again, you have this roadmap of the integral equation, and then you could verify your work. But it is really quite difficult to sort it out without the integral equation. So maybe a good example of that is the next paper, which generalizes it um, even further. So, I guess typical of John King, he's taken the hard problem and made it even harder. So now you've got the previous, um, the previous was a third order problem. So now it becomes a fifth order problem. And you can generalize this and, and, and end up with kind of arbitrary order problems of this type. The key with all these problems is that the steady state solution is a thing that you already know. Okay, so that, that makes everything a lot simpler. Um, and again, I kind of struggled to figure out what I want to communicate about um, this work by Bode, King, and Tu, um, but, but, but I, th I think it's as follows. So you would go and you would try to find out what are the possible saddle point or exponentials of this problem, and it's much more complicated, okay? So you end, end up with seven possibilities, W naught through W to the six, of, of possible WKB uh, J switchings, and you'll have kind of these seven possibilities for the different possible singularities in the problem. This one is written down for the x plus i singularity, or x equal to minus i singularity. But all the singularities in your problem will generate additional uh, possible exponentials. Okay? Um, three of them are quite blasé. So the first one is just corresponds to the regular asymptotic expansion. The, the next two correspond to steady state solutions. So these are the real uh, interesting ones. These are the time-dependent exponentials. And you can go and try to figure out what these time-dependent um, singulant functions are. The problem is you have to sort out the interaction of all these possible singulants. So what did you take away from this table? Where th this is a table where they tried to work out the, the, the possible singulant switching. So on the, on, the, on, the, on the top here, on the columns, you could think of this as the switcher. And on the rows here, you can think of that as a switchy. Each each singulant, you need to figure out where the possible turning points where they're interacting, the switcher and the switchy. And then you need to figure out whether they can generate Stokes lines and if whether those Stokes lines are active or inactive. Okay? That's, I think that's, the, that's what you should take away from this quite complicated picture. And uh, this, is, this, is, this is trying to classify the different turning points of the problem where, where the two exponentials are equal, whereas this one is trying to establish the local stroke, Stokes line structure. And then you have to go and try to figure out what lies in each region of, of this complex uh, uh, X and T space. And remember, there's also complex X and complex T. So I don't know whether that's important to, to consider. But, um, and again, the last couple of days, I've been asking John, can you tell me what is important about this? And I think we just concluded it's really hard. <laughs> right? that's, that's the problem. And, um, so you, like a detective, you have to kind of piece together what's in each region, and uh, you'll use certain insights in addition to that. So you might do some small time analysis or long time analysis, and that might give you some insights about what should lie in each region. Okay, so why are PDs so much harder? Um, some reasons are given here. The first is that we gave you a cooked up problem that you could solve things analytically. So you have to remember that your leading order solutions, you may not always have them. You may only have them numerically, right? So 
this is one important reason. The second reason is that the singulant functions, these um, you know, the e to the, to, to the w's and so forth, they now live in some higher dimensional space and you have to find them and it's not so easy to find them as well. The multiplicity of singulants creates this very intricate Stokes line structure and higher order Stokes phenomena structure and it seems to be quite important to resolve this structure because otherwise you end up with inconsistencies in the system. PD numerics are hard to do and there's a lack of toy problems. Okay, so that's one of the reasons why I think there were these three papers and maybe not so much that followed on from those three papers. Okay, so uh, let's give you some additional PDE problems to think about and talk about some of the issues, some of the further issues we have with these PDE problems. So let's return to the water wave problem that I talked about. And essentially, the, the dream is as follows. You, I'd like you to be able to give me any body, any shape, any um, ge geometry, and then I will study this problem and I will tell you the waterways that develop following the body. That's basically the dream. Now, the, the, the connection to asymptotic asymptotics is that within some higher dimensional complex space, you expect these kind of Stokes surfaces to emerge. Um, they're, they're often connected to the geometry of the body, but they're more generally connected with the complex analytic structure, and they intersect free space along certain curves, and those are the curves across waves are switched on. Okay, so that's essentially the dream. What makes it so hard? Well, uh, let's look at the simplest problem you can kind of look at. So this was studied by Chris Lustry and John Chapman in 2013, but it's a classic problem. Um, you, you think of a point source. So this is basically flow pass, think of it like a point source. I put a point source at z is equal to minus h, uh, sorry, at z is equal to minus h, and then I needed an image source at z is equal to h uh, to, to get things to work. And so this is essentially the simplest kind of flow that you can have. In the, in the, in the case of the point source lies on the surface, this is what's known as the classic Kelvin wave problem, right, that you, you'll, you'll study in a lot of your fluid mechanics courses, okay? But remember again that this is a cooked up problem, um, that it, in general, there's a very complicated ship, uh, ship or body here, and I don't even have any analytical solutions for anything more complicated than a point source. So we don't even, what we need just to solve phi naught is we need the solution, if you want, you want the analytical solution of flow past the body where the free surface is flat, because that's the leading order solution. And for anything more complicated than a point, I don't think any exists, right? So you'd have to do finite elements or some other um, scheme to do it. So now, uh, you want to predict this singulant function, which, which, which is responsible for the divergence and the exponentials, and uh, you can either do so, for the, for the toy problem I just gave, you can either do so assuming that the, the, the source is quite small, but in general, you have to solve this um, nonlinear PDE for a complex X and complex Y, where this phi naught function is, you feed it in. Okay, and remember, we don't really have those. You have certain initial conditions for this chi function, mainly that they're zero at the singularities in the complex plane. So here you have singularities at some manifold in the complex plane for x and y complex. And so now the challenge is to solve this PDE. Okay, and then once you've solved it, you can then try to find its intersection with, with physical space, and, and that would tell you where waves are switched on. So, um, as I mentioned, there, there was this very um, nice work by Chris Lustry and John Chapman in 2013 where they, where they do it. And for this problem here, where the source is considered to be quite small, you can analytically solve for it. You can, you can solve this using uh, method of characteristics. You can get the, the singlet function. And in doing so, you'll essentially predict this kind of uh, s structure. So, uh, what this graph is, essentially looking from top-down view, the flow is going from left to right, and um, the Stokes surface intersection with free space either occurs along this um, straight vertical line or along this curve, okay? So in, that relates to kind of the, the actual structure of the waves. That relates to either the switching on of longitudinal waves, which are across this vertical line, and uh, transverse waves. Okay, so there's an association between this exponentially small switching and the ways that we all naturally see um, in the water. Okay, the question is, how do you do this when you cannot solve this equation here? So you have to do this thing numerically. 
And so that's the question that um, I don't really know how to do. So I want to show you why it's quite complicated. So you have, to, um, you have to solve this equation here. Let's take the more general version, where phi naught, let's for, assume for simplicity, I actually know what the phi naught is. So it's some function I'm going to feed in. Okay? And I have to solve it from some initial state. This is, this is the analog of just plotting the Stokes line. Right? So you, you, you have a prescription for the Stokes line, and you want to plot um, its values. So you can essentially do this with complex rays. You can rewrite it using Sharpe's method. And essentially, that gives you a system of x, y, p, q, and chi that you have to solve. S and t are essentially parametrizations of these complex rays. So uh, it, it works as follows. You, um, you first start off with your singularity in the free surface, and then you complexify it. Okay? So now your singularity is some manifold in complex space. Okay? You then discretize this manifold. So S is a discretization of the manifold, and then T is the complex ray coordinate. Okay? You then, uh, that, that's what I was, uh, that's what, what these things uh, explain. Then you need to solve these complex ray equations, and you're interested in the, in the surface of those complex rays for which the imaginary part of chi is constant or zero. That gives you the Stokes line. Okay, that's what you have to do. And then you have to find the ones, the, only those particular rays that hit the free surface. Okay, so that's the challenge. Now, in, in the context of the linear source problem, it's quite easy. Well, I wouldn't say it's quite easy. Um, the rays are straight lines, and you can kind of do them. This is the problem that you get. So this is the simplest problem you have, but just source. Okay? So the, the graph that you see here is the complex manifold. It's a discretization of the singularity in complex S space. The, the four graphs that you see here is basically the xy plane. It's the, it's the water surface viewed from, from above. Okay? And the point of this graph is just to illustrate that the complex rays to figure out where complex rays go to, you have to, you're shooting rays, you pick a point in S space, the rays will shoot in complex time and then land somewhere on the free surface. But there's a weird, I mean, not a weird, but the problem is badly multivalued. So different points in S map to different points that determine the four possible singulants. Okay? And I don't know how to make this any better. So you, you might say, well, maybe there's a coordinate mapping that fixes this so you don't get this multivalued nature, and it's not obvious how you, how you would do it. Okay? So um, how do we try to do this in, 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 in general? Well, what we can do is we can basically uh, seed a coarse mesh for the singularity surface find certain intersections, and then try to numerically analytically continue. Sorry, numerically continue, not analytically continue. Numerically continue. So for example, this is our coarse mesh. We find which points of those coarse mesh will lead to ray intersections with the free surface, and, and then we follow them along. And hopefully, these green points will then correspond to a set of points on the free surface where your Stokes surface has intersected. So this is one scheme that we've applied. If we apply it to a nonlinear problem, then what you find is that it warps the previous Stokes surface intersection from a very trivial straight line to now a curved line, which is what you expect. So you expect that for nonlinear geometries, the Stokes surface is now quite non-trivial, it's now curved, and so what you're expecting is that for waves to kind of switch on past this winged structure. You also end up with a whole bunch of other crap that we haven't been able to figure out. Um, how do you stay sane and make sure what you're doing is actually correct? You can try to do some asymptotics. So you can try to look at the limit of weak sources and, and do those asymptotics and verify that your numerical intersections of the Stokes surface with the free surface are consistent with that. So you can uh, be a, a better scientist and try to, try, try to verify some of those predictions. But overall, um, this is quite an unsatisfactory route. We don't have a better way of doing it. And I'm quite interested in, in this. So uh, to give you an actual question that we can't do, 
Um, so if I put surface tension in this problem, so I, a minor modification of this problem, I, I, previously I just had gravity, now I add surface tension into it, my singulant function becomes a little bit more complicated. Beta and tau are just scalar numbers here, but the ray space for this looks completely awful. So it's, it, this is, again, it's troubling that this is the most generic problem for you know, a PDE. You have to essentially solve for these singulant functions in some higher dimensional complex space, find their intersections with physical space. You have to kind of do it somewhat numerically. And um, the, the issue is, is actually quite simple. In one dimensions or a, 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 in, in one real dimension and complexified two, uh, sorry, two real dimensions, one complex dimension, Stokes lines essentially just divide the plane. Right? So it's very easy to find out what their structure is numerically. You can just solve for the Stokes lines, they divide the plane. Now you have this four dimensional space that you're trying to shoot rays in. You no longer have a division of that volume anymore and it becomes really hard to work out the geometry, this complex geometry. So that is a, sort of an impasse. Okay, so let me say some, this is the last part of, of, of the research side of things. I wanna end on a more hopeful note. And I want to talk about how some of the techniques we've been using have, have kind of shed new light on classic water waves. So this is a, a, a famous water wave. This is the Stokes wave. It's just a, a wave traveling from left to right without change of form. It's a nonlinear water wave. Again, that's a hard problem to compute, but historically quite significant Stokes. Uh, this is called a Stokes wave, right? Um, and what's interesting is that if you feed in a little bit of surface tension into this, Right? What you expect is for ripples to appear on this free surface, but it's not actually clear from the, if I write down the Stokes wave equations, whether um, I can end up with kind of steady state or st steadily traveling waves with surface tension. It's not, even that fundamental question is not clear. Okay? Um, so this is the, the first question I ask is, do solutions parasitic ripples exist in the simplest steady inviscid irritational model? So if I take the, the normal Stokes wave formulation, I add surface tension into it, do I get solutions with little ripples on top um, in this steadily traveling framework? Um, if so, what is their analytical structure and what happens if I add some non-trivial time dependence is added? Let me kind of show you the, the previous research on this over the last kind of many decades, um, just so you can kind of see that it is a non-trivial problem. So uh, these are old computations by Schwartz and Vandenbroek. What they do is just kind of nonlinear um, computations of this, of, of numerical calculations of, of, of these water wave problems. Um, just for context, these are not just pure differential equations, they're integral differential equations. And th th what you should uh, get from this picture on the left-hand side here is that you're choosing different surface tension values and you're choosing certain gravity values and the solution space is a nightmare, okay? So th there's a zoo of solutions. Even this very basic traveling water wave problem, there's kind of an infinite number of solutions, is non-unique, it's quite a hard problem to solve, okay? And what we can do with exponential asymptotics is that we can develop structure in this, and I can explain how this picture actually reorganizes itself in the limit that b tends to zero. And you take a, a, a very complicated problem and you can add structure to it, just from looking at the exponential asymptotics. Uh, here's another kind of, um, a, a, so Chen and Safman published a, 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 a three-part three landmark papers on gravity capillary waves where they wrote the gravity wave is therefore a singular limit which cannot be reached smoothly by applying the limit of kappa, surface tension to zero, uh, to a gravity capillary wave. So they're pointing out in this 1979 paper that there's some real issues with taking the, the small surface tension limit. And in fact, they predicted that you couldn't take it continuously, which we show um, to be wrong. So um, my student, Josh Shelton, or now postdoc, went and computed these things. And I want to point out that the computation of these things is not straightforward, okay? But this is the kind of structure that reveals itself when the surface tension parameter is quite small. Essentially, the solution organizes itself into these thing, what we call fingers. Each finger consists of uh, essentially a gravity wave with little dimples on top. So the idea is that by developing the exponential asymptotics as b tends to zero, you can end up with these predictions of what these dimples have to be, and that will give you structure where you had none previously. So it's quite remarkable. 
Um, I want to point out some features of these, of these graphs. So just, just as an example, uh, no, OK, so, so, so what I'm trying to, OK, so what, what I'd like to, to just emphasize is that in looking at the limit that B tends to 0, surface tension is 0, what you're hoping is to match up with this gravity wave, this pure gravity wave solution on the left here. That's the Stokes wave, OK? And you'll notice that if I ride the tips of the fingers, let's say item B here, that corresponds to here, it looks like a gravity wave, which is perturbed by my little oscillations. So that's the exponential asymptotics you'd like to develop. What we show is that this picture, this very complicated picture by uh, Schwartz and Vandenbroek can be reorganized if you look under from the right kind of energy. Okay, so l l let me just kind of show. Uh, okay, so what this, okay. <laughs> okay, so the, the, the previous picture I showed you the bifurcation diagram where it was well organized into nice fingers, essentially that's this tiny bit of space here. Okay? And the point is that as, as your perturbative parameter B gets to be larger, it becomes nonlinear, and the structure becomes much more complicated. But by looking at the limit that B tends to zero, you can kind of straighten out all your curves, and you can develop structure from this problem. Okay? You can go and measure the, the, the amplitude of these ripples and verify they're exponentially small, and you can develop a theory for them. That's the point of this graph. The theory essentially says that above the crest of the wave, there's a singularity and then a mirror singularity. And these singularities are responsible for Stokes lines. These Stokes lines essentially travel in complex space, hit the tip of the wave, and across that, those are the formation of the ripples. Okay. We can predict the analytical form of the wave. We can verify it matches up with the numerics. And also, our exponential asymptotics also tells us where the side branching is from this. Okay. So I, I thought this was a remarkable result because we've, it, it's essentially a problem where asymptotics leads the way. Right? A problem where you had no structure before, where now you can do a bit of analysis and kind of clear up this prick this very unclear picture, and, and quite a fundamental problem. There are still a lot of mysteries that we don't understand about water waves. If I add now non-trivial time, then I can essentially go between uh, traveling, steadily traveling waves, and then standing water waves. Okay, so you can, uh, you understand that this picture, this steadily traveling picture I gave him before is, all, is only one of many possible solutions you can form. If you look at this picture on the right-hand side, so this was um, uh, researched by a PhD student from Bristol in 1996. These are fully time-dependent simulations of water waves, and you can see the parasitic ripples that form on the free surface. The question is, do, does this system admit some kind of quasi-static state in the sense of a, of a steadily traveling gravity wave and then a ripple which repeats after some amount of time? That fundamental question is still unknown, right? But what we're hoping, basically, that we can apply our exponential, uh, exponential asymptotics to it and then answer that kind of question. Um, again, I, I want to emphasize how you can develop structure just from looking at exponentially small terms. So now, uh, so this is kind of ongoing work by Josh Shelton. He's looking at the standing water wave problem. So you have a, a, a wave. Um, conf which is periodic at, at both ends and also periodic in time. You add a small amount of surface tension into it, and the, 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 the bolded black curve is the solution that forms. You can see that the bolded black curve seems to be a perturbation of the um, underlying curve, which is the pure gravity wave, no surface tension. So of course you look at that and you say exponential asymptotics, right? Small surface tension, seemingly perturbed. There must be a theory for these little ripples that form. Um, you can try to measure their amplitude and confirm on some kind of semi-log plot that it is, looks to be exponentially small. This is going to be required. This is our PDE theory, right? You, you need fully PDE theory for that kind of problem. And again, I want to emphasize that if you can somehow develop the, 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 the asymptotics, it will show you structure where there perhaps isn't. 
uh, where there perhaps is, but that hasn't been previously found. So the point is that um, the point of this graph is to plot different families of standing waterways. The, the surface tension parameters on the horizontal axis, you're trying to produce predictions as that tends to zero, some energy norm on, on the vertical axis. And you can see these kind of finger patterns that we detected previously. And the point is they exist within the time-dependent framework, um, and we'd hope to find this, the explanations for this structure soon. Okay, so uh, a, a last few slides, kind of indulgent slides about where we might want to go, I suppose. Um, I wanted to mention, so Sam Crew has been here, so he's a postdoc and he's had a lot of enjoyable conversations with people here. So I want just to advertise some of the, uh, a different way of thinking that I didn't appreciate previously before this I and I program. So we work in this kind of, I work in this area of applied exponential asymptotics. It's, it's you know, cl classical mechanics um, focus, but then obviously all of you come with your um, other beyond all orders theories. And I essentially asked Sam to, to, to explain to me how our applied exponential asymptotics can be reinterpreted re uh, re uh, within the Borel plane. So can you do what we do in, in physical land, in Z land, within the Borel plane, and what does that mean? Okay? So it's uh, kind of parametric resurgence for singular perturbation theory. And I've begun to appreciate the viewpoint that you get from the Borel plane. It, 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 there are advantages to working in the Borel plane. Um, and in particular, I mean, ba the basic advantage is that for me, or one of the advantages is that it allows you to create problems much more easily than looking at it from a perspective of a differential equation. Because within the Borel plane, once you've removed the factorial growth, they're just holomorphic functions. So you can make up your whole universe of holomorphic functions, look at what happens for all sorts of different holomorphic functions, and then kind of go back to the differential equations world and, and see what that corresponds to. And that's a powerful viewpoint that I never appreciated previously, because previously I start life usually with the differential equation and try to develop that. Um, Sam is, is also working on how to apply some of the technology. So, so um, Gerald Dunn and Ovidio Costin have, have given very interesting works about how you can do uh, numerical PADE, uh, numerical PADE uh, techniques and conformal mapping techniques to basically clear up the singularity structure in the Borel plane. And the question is, can you use that for our singular perturbed problem? So now with a better understanding of how our techniques translate in the, in the Borel plane, perhaps that's possible. I'm also quite interested in how these Borel plane methods, how do you do PDEs in the Borel plane? I mean, in the Borel plane, it's, it's always a PDE, but now you have a multi-dimensional um, PDE in the physical variables as well. Um, I want to give one insight about one different way of thinking that, that Sam has, has kind of, ha, has given me about how to do this applied exponential asymptotics in the Borel plane. And, and uh, so I've drawn two pictures, and, and this is the way I think of it. So you, hopefully you understand what this Borel function is. Essentially just our usual perturbation expansion, but dividing out the divergence. Okay, so um, we usually have y naught and epsilon y1, et cetera. You divide out the divergence and you have your Borel function. W, in, in, in essence, um, has taken the role of epsilon, but these, this is parametric resurgence, so all of your, uh, uh, your Borel function also depends on a z. And alternatively, you can think of it as just writing a solution as an inverse Laplace transform, okay? In the Borel plane, you'll naturally think of expansions about the origin in W, but also you can have expansions about the singularities in the Borel plane. And the connection, of course, is that when you expand your Borel um, transform about those singularities, these components, A naught, alpha, and chi, are exactly the saddle point switchings. So if you can develop what these, uh, uh, what these numbers are, or what these functions are, that will tell you what those saddle point um, contributions are. To get equations for A0, A1, et cetera, and chi and alpha, it just involves substitution into either your Borel um, PDE or into the original differential equation in the same way as we would have substituted our late orders and that's in and found those uh, functions. The question is how you do, do you determine the initial conditions on the problem, okay? And the way that we do it in, in this picture is we get our divergent 
expansion, and then we perform a complex uh, match asymptotics problem with the singularity. We zoom in near the singularity, we develop an inner solution near the singularity, and then we match outwards and, and match it there. What's the interpretation in the Borel plane? Well, in the Borel plane, uh, this is kind of the picture um, that you might imagine. So the horizontal slices are bas is basically your Borel plane, CW, complex W space. In the complex W plane, you're kind of expanding about the origin. That's what this series is. And there's a disk of convergence to the nearest singularity. That nearest singularity is, for instance, the chi point. Okay? So as Z changes in the physical plane, you can think of moving up this axis. And as I approach the critical point Z star, where the singular is zero, it shrinks the radius convergence of my disk to zero. That's you know, the, the Borel um, interpretation of what happens when you approach the singularity in physical space. And in order to do this complex, this match asymptotics that I mentioned, what you can do is you can do a coordinate mapping and send s to be w over chi. And that has the effect of basically keeping the radius convergence fixed so that your singularity, w equal to chi, now lies at 1. Once you've done this coordinate mapping, you can then expand your Borel function into powers of s and also powers of z star. And that allows you to systematically develop the initial conditions of the problem. So a very cool uh, alternative viewpoint of our applied asymptotics in the Borel plane. Right, uh, last few slides. This, this is the super indulgent part. Um, right, <laughs> what am I interested in? OK, future of x much asymptotics. I think my criticism is that I think we've been using a lot of the same examples. We still continue to use a lot of the same examples. And there's a good reason for that, because they're historical and they're deep. So water waves, Safman-Taylor, crystal growth, these are our bread and butter examples of x much, uh, x -much asymptotics. Um, I'm very interested in new problems as well. And one of the challenges we have is that we don't have a catalog of PDE problems. So I'm interested in hearing your thoughts after, after the workshop. How do we develop a, a catalog of interesting PDE problems in exponential uh, asymptotics? Why did the three works in the, 2000, in, in the 2000 era stagnate and what we can do to push it forwards? And what are some of the exciting PDE application areas for beyond all orders? Other things that we're interested in. Um, this is very clear. So it's quite clear that we're starting to reach analytical bottlenecks in terms of the applications of some of these theories. And I want to point out some, a really important point. The, the, the interesting water wave problems that we've worked on, the challenge is not necessarily to do the x much asymptotics. It's actually to, to, to solve the problem numerically. So to, once you've done the x much asymptotics, you need to verify that it produces good predictions to your numerics. But often the numerics are even more challenging than the asymptotics themselves, right? So this is the, the gravity capillary wave is a good example of that. These are solutions that nobody had found. We had to find it numerically first, then we developed the asymptotic system for that. The finding it numerically is a real issue. I mean, you need sophisticated numerical techniques to do it. So it seems that for a lot of the physical problems that we're interested in these days, just doing the numerics is, is becoming a bottleneck. Um, another one last perspective here is that if you've kind of talk to, to, for example, Chris Lustry and, and myself, one of the things that we're trying to do is to generate divergence, to, to generate theory for exponential asymptotics, you need to know what the analytic continuation of the leading order solution is as a baseline. It's the most basic thing you need. But uh, for example, of waves past a ship, you would essentially need to solve that problem using finite elements somehow, right, Laplace's equation, and then this complicated wave structure problem, and then analytically continue that problem. And that would feed into your exponential asymptotics. So it's quite a complicated procedure. Even for more basic problems, we're running to this issue where we can't understand what the singular structure is um, for the leading order problems. And so that brings up the question of how do you, can you use kind of the, 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 the pod A approximate, triple A, or other in, or interpolants that, to generate the complex plane? which you can do, but there's not a lot of theory on <coughs> whether that's legit. Let, let's just say that, right? And I don't, so I don't know how far you can push that idea in the future. Can you take your phi naught, 
apply Pade approximants to it, develop singularities, and, and you say that's the end of the day. I'm, I'm happy that the Pade approximate is a good approximation of the, of the Allen continuation. There is not that, even now, you know, 50 years after Pade approximants um, have become uh, well used, that's not well known. It's not well known how they approach, um, how their singularities will um, approach the true problem. And then finally, something to, I, I suppose, to, to kind of motivate us all, um, it's quite clear that from this program, we are kind of applied exponential asymptotics is just one picture, right? There are other asymptotic um, techniques out there. Uh, talking to Sam has made me appreciate that there is a lot that we can learn from each other, so I think the, the next era will hopefully bring us all together a little bit more closely. You know, it's still a challenge to understand what everyone's working on, um, but uh, it's an important challenge that I think will lead to some of the breakthroughs of the future. All right, thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, very nice talk, very good. And uh, I'm sure there will be questions or comments. Um, are there any questions or comments? I shouldn't be that sure. <laughs> but was uh, yeah, so, some, sometimes think, the questions are you know you gotta well, should you be over a, a wine or something nice, like that. <laughs> you, you posed lots of questions, so people are thinking about this. I'm thinking about this. <laughs> uh, I enjoyed that a lot. Uh, thanks very much, Phil. Uh, another, I think, issue that we're going to start running into soon, which is related to this and the utility, is we haven't thought much in our analysis to this point of the stability of waves. And as we get into nonlinear PDE, that's going to become more and more important. Um, some of the work that Aaron's been doing on nonlinear Schrodinger and the like. But the nice thing is, I mean, there's this recent paper by Kozirev and the work, uh, the work that led up to it with Chapman where they, they do think about uh, these waves with the language of stability and sort of show how it can be teased out. I think we probably need to put a bit more thought into generalizing that idea because we can have all the asymptotic predictions we want if they're not stable, they're not it's that It's naturally meaningful. when you present your water, you know, these exponential asymptotics at a, an actual, you know, water wave conference or a, or a physics yeah. conference, people will ask, you know, what, what is the stability of these things? And you say, well, you know, it's, it's, I'm just doing the asymptotics. Um, and so, yes, we have to, we have to do time-dependent analysis for the stability. And the um, other thing with that is, of course, we've always sort of hand-waved it away by the fact that if you can get it numerically, it's going to be stable because the code yeah. worked. But as we do more asymptotic-led problems, uh, we can't necessarily use that argument. It also depends on where you want your career to go, right? I mean, if you want to develop more the, the, the technology of asymptotics, then perhaps that's less of a concern because you understand that you are working with kind of these deep fundamental issues of, of perturbation theory. But yes, if you want to connect with the engineering and the physical sciences community, you do have to, to think hard about the stability and the, and the realness of what you're working with. Thank you. Are there any more questions or comments? Um, so if not, I'll uh, thank Phil again. Uh, <coughs> sorry, before you leave, can I just make it, <coughs> get my voice back. So lunch again today is over in Churchill, so we can all walk over together. Um, the administration here has agreed to make some bookings for various travel for people who really need help to get to airports or train stations. Um, we had a meeting with the director just before. So they're going to be doing some stuff now making a revised list and try to make bookings. If you are in the situation where you need to get to an airport or a train station the next few days for whatever reason, please check with them, okay? I'm not gonna try and deliver things secondhand because it's just impossible. So go to the reception, talk to Amanda later this afternoon because my understanding is they're making the list right now and starting to call. And the plan is that if people need rides, We'll just do a uniform pickup location in front of Churchill because it's sort of central rather than giving the 
company, various locations, which they will screw up. So right, I'm just saying, if you're in this situation, talk to them later this afternoon and just make sure you get the reservation. They'll be emailing reservation numbers and contacts.